Death House is an introductory quest to the Curse of Strahd adventure module. It takes players from levels 1 to level 3 and sets the tone for the gothic horror atmosphere that follows. As written, Death House is a macabre tale of cult activity, human sacrifice, ritual suffering, and childhood tragedy. If that sounds like fun to you, let's turn it up to 11 and get ready to traumatize your players. The first thing that we have to do for Death House is move it outside of the village of Barovia and towards the Eastern Gate, more in the wilderness area. We do this because it's more of a remote location, it lends to the creepy vibe of Death House, and it makes it a lot easier to get your players in there without railroading them with the closing of the mists that is written into the module itself. With this being the only bastion of civilization for miles around and the first one that the players encounter, they're going to be a lot more willing to walk inside. If they're inside of the village, they're going to want to explore around, and again, we don't want to railroad them by closing off the mists and saying, you have to go in here. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to stop calling it Death House. It's Durst Manor from here on out, at least to your players' faces. If you call it Death House, well, that's a bit on the nose. It's going to put your players on guard, and they may not even want to go in. And speaking of putting your players on guard, don't ever show your players pictures of the Durst children that are in the book. It's wonderful artwork, don't get me wrong, but they look freaking evil. Your players aren't going to trust them, they're not going to want to follow them into the house, and it's just going to set the whole thing up for a bad time. So before I get too far into this, I want to give a big thanks to MandyMod, Dragnacarta, and all the other Reddit users that helped compile a bunch of fantastic advice for running Curse of Strahd. We couldn't have done this without them, and you have all helped us make a better adventure. Next, we're going to change up the Durst family history. In the module, the Dursts are just your typical run-of-the-mill cultists who cook their victims and serve them to their cult friends. That's all well and good, and it's standard D&D fare, but it's very one-dimensional. We're going to kick this up a notch and make them into three-dimensional characters with some sort of believable and maybe even relatable background. We'll change things up a bit by making Mr. and Mrs. Durst minor nobles, landowners, and well-to-do merchants right around the time that Strahd took over Barovia. When Strahd turned into a vampire and darkness consumed the land, that darkness infected the Dursts. Mr. Durst became sullen and withdrawn, and Mrs. Durst became cold and obsessed with youth and vanity. Mr. Durst, in search of the light that had left his life, turned to the children's nursemaid, Margaret. Their affair ended with Margaret's pregnancy and the ire of Mrs. Durst. Mrs. Durst, driven mad with jealousy and vanity, turned to the legends of Strahd and his immortality. She started a cult dedicated to finding the secrets of eternal youth at all costs. Mr. Durst found himself drawn in and complicit with their dark deeds as they drew in travelers, neighbors, and strangers to their house and sacrificed them on the stone altar in the basement of Durst Manor. Nothing ever came of these vile deeds, however. Week after week, they slaughtered more passers-by, only to be met with silence from the darkness. During each sacrifice, the Durst children, Rose and Thorn, were locked away in their attic bedroom by their parents, only let out once the cult's activities had been cleaned up. In a world of darkness, depravity, and vileness, this was at least a genuine act of kindness. Eventually, the bastard son of Mr. Durst and Margaret was born. Baby Walter, they named him. This snapped something inside of Mrs. Durst. One night, she locked away her children in their attic bedroom and stole away to the nursemaid's suite with a knife. There, she murdered Margaret in her sleep. She then took baby Walter from his crib and took him down to the cellar. She placed the innocent child on the stone altar. She chanted an unholy prayer into the darkness and sacrificed the infant. This time, her prayers were heard. Norganus, the finger of oblivion, had seen the vile act of Mrs. Durst and listened to her prayer. Amused by her desperation and her wickedness, he deigned to grant the wish of Mrs. Durst and her followers. He made them immortal by turning them into ghasts and ghouls. Mr. Durst, amidst his transformation, discovered the heinous deeds of his wife. Driven mad with despair, he hung himself in the master bedroom. Mrs. Durst and the remaining cultists were driven insane. 
and quickly lost themselves amidst the catacombs of the Durst Manor cellar. With no one left to check on them or let them out of their room, Rose and Thorn sadly expired after several days without food or water. The story doesn't end here. Through the violence and the depravity of his death, Walter's spirit did not find rest in that unholiest of places. Instead, his spirit was bound to the remains of the other sacrifices that still remained in the cellar. Now, instead of a shambling mound, a new horror awaits your players. A flesh mound sits in the deepest part of the Durst Manor with baby Walter at its heart. You'll find the stat block to this new monster in the description down below. Now that we've reformed the history of Death House, aka Durst Manor, it's time to lure some players inside. With this version of the house now on the Spallage Road, well outside the village of Barovia, you can now place Rose and Thorn on the Spallage Road itself, waving down any passers-by for help. They look distressed and worried and plead with your players to come and rescue their baby brother from the monster in the basement. Their parents went down there hours ago, they say, and they haven't returned. They're starting to get worried. Unless your players are vile beings, which in that case they'll fit right in with the rest of Barovia, they're probably going to rush off to the aid of these children. The children will, of course, willingly lead them up to the house, but as written, are not going to enter into the house, stating that they're far too afraid to go back inside. As the players approach the house, they see three buildings. The first, of course, being the stately manor house itself, looking well-maintained and clean and pristine. And then on either side, they see uh, servants' quarters and a stable, both of them ruined and moldering and just fallen into complete disrepair. This is going to be the first clue that something is not quite right here. At this point, let your players go into the house and start exploring. Now, in the module, it states that all of the lights are off and it doesn't look like anybody's home. Now, in my version of Death House, I went ahead and I had all the fires burning, lights were on, and it looked like people actually lived there. On the first floor of the house, players are going to find mainly the dining room and the den. As they near the dining room, explain to your players that they hear the sound of laughter and the clinking of silverware. As they enter into the dining room, however, the sounds immediately stop. The dining room is empty save for a feast laid out on the table. If any of your players partake in the food that's on the table, have them roll a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they gorge themselves, and the food returns to its original state of rotten, maggot-infested, and just you. Any player who ate any of the food will at that point become poisoned. In the den, everything's pretty much normal, except that when the players aren't looking at the wolves, the wolves move around. Now, the wolves don't attack or anything, at least at this point. And if the players attack the wolves, well, they fall apart just like any other stuffed wolf would. Upstairs on the second floor, players will primarily find the library and the conservatory. In the library, they'll find the journal of Mr. Durst. It starts out normally enough, detailing his trade, his life, and then as the darkness falls over Barovia, things start to go a little off-kilter begins to describe his despondency and nightmares, and then finally it ends with his affair with Margaret and the goings-on of the cult. Additionally, one player can find a special book that perfectly describes their own life, right up to the point of reading said book. Then it describes a monster of darkness creeping up behind said player, and ending in a final page splashed with blood. When the player turns around, they see nothing. There isn't actually a monster, it's just the house playing tricks on the players and giving them kind of a, a really creepy vibe. But if you want to put a monster in there, go right ahead. In the conservatory, perceptive players hear a soft whining coming from underneath the harpsichord. When they look beneath, they find a small white dog, cute as could be, but starving, emaciated. He's been here for several days and hasn't had any food to eat. He certainly won't eat what's on the table, because he can probably tell what it really is. The dog bears the name tag of Lancelot, but you can go ahead and name him whatever you want. He belongs to Gertruda, a resident of the village of Barovia, who disappeared about a week ago. Lancelot went looking for Gertruda, and somehow ended up in Death House. He gives the players a contrasting element to the darkness that 
is to follow, and he also gives them something to sacrifice in the altar room later on during the quest's climax. On the third floor of the manor, players get their first taste of combat in Barovia. The animated armor here will try its best to push players over the railing so that they fall 30 feet to the first floor below. After they defeat the animated armor, they are left with the nursemaid's suite on one side and the master bedroom on the other. There's also a combat for an animated broom in here, but I recommend dropping that out. It's a little too silly for the kind of adventure that we're running here. Upon entering the master suite, players are greeted by the hanging corpse of Mr. Durst, a suicide note clutched in his fist. Additionally, players will find some missives from Mrs. Durst that detail her descent into madness, her vanity, her wrath around her husband's infidelity, and her dealings with the cult. In the nursemaid suite, players find the floating, spectral figure of Margaret, the nursemaid. If they choose to speak to her, Margaret alternates between not knowing where she is and being very confused, and knowing that she is dead and being very angry with Mrs. Durst. She never speaks ill of Mr. Durst or the children, however. If the players choose to investigate the crib that is in the nursery, that's when Margaret starts to get a little defensive. She tells the players not to wake her baby, to leave him alone. If the players persist, you as the dungeon master have a choice to make. You can keep this as a roleplay encounter and have Margaret disappear, despondent that the players did not listen to her. Or you can have her turn into the specter that was originally written in the module and run this as a combat encounter. Up in the attic, the players find a couple of spare rooms, as well as the children's bedroom and a storage room. In the spare rooms, there isn't much to find except a creepy doll that sits in the corner. Go ahead and have that start moving around like the wolves in the den when the players aren't looking. It's not going to actually do anything but creep the players out. When the players finally get into the children's room, the encounter should go pretty much as written. Be sure to portray the children for what they are. Children. They're lost, scared, innocent, and lonely. Eventually, the players will investigate the dollhouse and find the secret staircase down into the basement that's located in the storage room. When the players do go to the storage room, they may also find Margaret's corpse inside of a trunk. If they've already encountered her in the nursemaid suite, don't bring her up here, it's just redundant. Go ahead and just let them head on down to the cellar, and be sure to level them up to level 2 at this point to prepare them for what's to come. Down in the basement, most things go pretty much according to script. Go ahead and add some flavor elements like a logbook in the cultist quarters that detail the victims and when they died and how they died and stuff like that. In the ghoul hallway, go ahead and tip your players off that something isn't right by describing an overpowering scent of death and decay. If they go down the hallway anyway, well, that's their fault. Over in the Dark Lord Shrine, let's go ahead and ratchet down the difficulty a little bit with those shadows by describing them as black marks on the wall themselves surrounding the statue and the orb. Only if players actually reach for the crystal ball do the shadows become active, sailing across the walls and the ceiling. At that point, roll for initiative and bring only a couple of shadows out per each round of combat to avoid overwhelming the players and having it cascade into a TPK. Speaking of that orb, if players touch it, describe the entire party as getting a sinking feeling in their stomach or trickling down their spine. They get an overwhelming sense of being watched. Strahd sees them now, if he hadn't before. Over in the cult leader's den, go ahead and remove the ghast that represents Mr. Durst. His body is, of course, up in the master bedroom. Mrs. Durst, however, is going to remain right where she's at. As the players are rifling through the chest at the foot of the bed, well, she pops out of the wall, as per script, and then begins berating them verbally. Uh, Mrs. Durst is absolutely insane and vulgar to a fault. She's going to hurl obscenities at the players and bash her children and Mr. Durst and Margaret and anybody else. If the players engage her in conversation and ask her what happened to Walter or what she did to him, she smiles evilly and invites them to go down to the basement and find out for themselves. Down on the bottom level of the Durst Manor, players initially encounter the Reliquary. This is an interesting room for dungeon masters, but not so much for players. Um, as written, there's basically 13 pieces of junk uh, scattered around the room in the various alcoves, and they don't have anything to do with the story. Well, I recommend replacing these with items that will foreshadow the adventure to come. 
Um, I personally had like part of a rock's feather, um, some crow claws, a hag's tooth, and some swamp water, am among some other things. Go ahead and think about what you want in this room and go ahead and put it in there. Don't expect your players to latch onto it too much, but perceptive players might write it down and then look back on it and go, hey, whoa, that's really cool. Now, the fun part, the ritual chamber. Players should be drawn here from the moment they enter into the cellar by chance from the cultists of, he is the ancient, he is the land. Only now can they actually understand what these chants are, now that they're close enough. Once they enter the chamber, the chanting stops with a faint trailing echo. Atop the stone altar in the center of the room is a white bundle. If players go to investigate, they find the white bundle contains a rusty, sacrificial knife, stained red with blood. At this point, the shadowy figures of the cultists appear all around the ritual chamber, demanding a sacrifice. One must die, they say. Your players have a choice now. Do they sacrifice one of their own? Do they refuse? Do they sacrifice the dog that they brought with them? After the players have made their choice, the portcullis slams shut. The chanting changes. Come, demon, we awaken thee. At this point, describe a rolling mass of decay and filth emerging from the westernmost alcove of the chamber. Thick tendrils of waste wriggle from it, gripping the walls, pulling itself forward toward the players. As the enormous thing crawls towards the party, they can see human remains inside of its putrid body. The flesh mound has emerged. The first thing the flesh mound is going to try to do is engulf a player. The affected player is sucked into the cavity inside the flesh mound where they get a clear view of baby Walter, crying and afraid. At this point, let them make an arcana check, DC 15. If they pass, they know how to break this curse. They have to take baby Walter out of the flesh mound somehow and bury him underneath the hearth of the house. After defeating the flesh mound and freeing Walter from its core, the house begins to fall down around the ears of the players. They'll have to get out before they're trapped inside forever. Run the escape as a skill challenge. If you don't know how to do that, check the video above players will have to accrue four successes before three failures. There's a lot to do during the challenge, so I recommend checking out the full write-up that I've linked down in the description below. Before you start the challenge, roll initiative. This is going to be basically your marching order. Who runs the fastest and who runs the slowest? Explain to your players that if they rack up three failures, the slowest player is going to be trapped inside. Any failure beyond that is an additional player trapped inside the house. When your players or what is left of them, make it out of the house, grant them level three. If they're still carrying Walter's corpse with them, they can find shovels that they can use to bury him inside the stables. If they do bury him, it's up to you as the dungeon master of whether or not the players that are trapped inside the house can escape. If they don't bury Walter, the curse of Durst Manor remains intact. If a player goes to enter the house again, they find that it has reset itself. It is back in the original shape and pristine, all the fires are lighted, the food is on the table, and any player trapped inside is gone. When your players return to the Spallage Road, they find a singular picnic basket filled with food, wine, and one letter. Welcome to Barovia, it says. Signed, Count Strahd von Zarovich.